Great. All right. We will go ahead and um, get started. Thanks for joining us today. Um, welcome. Uh, we hope that this will be an engaging and interesting dialogue focused on assessing innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystems in low and middle income countries. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Hoffecker, and I'm a research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology um, and the lead researcher for the Local Innovation Group, an interdisciplinary research group based at um, MIT Sociotechnical Systems Research Center. I'm joined in this session by Dr. Elias Damtu Asefa, who is a current post postdoctoral associate with the Local Innovation Group as well as two colleagues from the SHARES team, Elizabeth Dolan, Research Associate at the University of Notre Dame, and Dr. John Muthama, Associate Professor of Environmental Science with the University of Nairobi. We're representing a larger team from Notre Dame and HEIs in three countries working together on the height study, which they'll introduce shortly. Um, our session today brings together our two teams to engage in a dialogue or kind of fireside chat of sorts with each of each with us and with you, um, where we'll focus on sharing lessons learned and early findings related to how to implement an innovation ecosystem assessment, present, which present a number of practical challenges on the ground. So in this session, we'll share some of the more interesting challenges that we've encountered to date, how we've approached resolving them and what we've been learning along the way and would recommend to other teams moving forward. So we'll start by briefly introducing each of our respective studies to provide a context for our findings. And then I'll share an innovation ecosystem framework that serves as a shared conceptual foundation for each of our studies. And then we'll dig into some of the challenges that we've been encountering in implementation, leaving quite a bit of time for um, questions and answers from all of you. So let me go ahead and turn it over to Dr. John Misama, who will introduce the Notre Dame team and the Height study. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, 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 the share basically stands for supporting holistic and actionable research in education and the heights stands for higher education institutions generating holistic and transformable solutions. So, um, to study the, the involvement of uh, higher education institutions and, and the strategies to enhance the engagement of higher education institutions in innovation at national or subnational level. Thank you. Over to you. Great. Thanks, John. So the Height study is researching the relationship between HEIs and the broader innovation ecosystems of which they're engaged in. Um, and in contrast, the innovation ecosystem study that the MIT team is engaged in focuses on assessing um, an innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem within a higher education institution, in this case, the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala, or UVG. So together with colleagues from UVG, we're currently conducting a rapid diagnostic of the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem at UVG's three campuses as part of a larger series of diagnostics that we're implementing as part of our first year of work on the USAID-funded Aspire project, which is part of the Bridge Train program within USAID's Innovation Technology and Research Hub. Projects under BridgeTrain, like Aspire, are capacity building projects that seek to strengthen the capacities for development-oriented research, innovation, and entrepreneurship within participating HEIs. The diagnostics that we're conducting at UVG as part of Aspire's first year of work are intended to provide upfront information on the complex university system that Aspire is intervening into. Um, so with that in mind, the innovation ecosystem diagnostic that we're performing is focused on providing us with a current state analysis of existing strengths and challenges within the university's ecosystem, as well as opportunities and top priorities for capacity building and strengthening moving forward. Um, the key research questions we focused on were therefore guided by conceptual and methodological work we've been engaged in over the past six years around understanding and operationalizing the concept of local innovation ecosystems, which as I'm sure you all know, have started to attract increasing policy and practitioner interest um, in the past few years, reflected in part in the number of sessions at this conference that are focused on innovation ecosystems. Um, and given that it is becoming a bit of a kind of buzzword or buzz concept, um, before proceeding further, we wanted to ask all of you to share with us and with each other what you've been hearing this term refer to and what you think about when you hear a local innovation ecosystem. So um, Adam, if you can pull up the next slide and we have a, a quick audience engagement question here. Um, if this is a term that you've been hearing in your work, how has it been used and what's the commonly understood meaning that it has in your context? So if you wanna just go ahead and um, add this in in chat, we're gonna keep it simple. But when you hear the term local innovation ecosystem um, in your work, what do you think of? What does this term evoke for you or how do you understand it? I'll give about a minute um, and then we'll just look at, look at some of what we've all been hearing in our respective areas of work. Mm 
it can be definitions, it can be a couple of phrases, but what do you think a local innovation ecosystem is? What does this mean to you? Someone saying startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. The actors and organizations that contribute to research and innovation within a geographic zone. Let's hear some more. What is, what is an innovation ecosystem? So actors working together to address specific challenges. Ah, actors working to solve problems within the context of the rules of the game, norms and regulatory frameworks that govern them. Let's see if we can get a few more. We might start to notice, we might start to notice some things. Any other? Definitions or guesses of a definition of what this what this concept is referring to. All right, ownership and the ability to create within your space. That's very interesting. Thanks, Corey. Um, so as we start to see, even just with a few answers, and you can keep them coming. You can keep thinking about this. What what this means. Um, these definitions have certain things in common, but there are also nuances and ways in which they're framing the concept distinctly. And those nuances um, matter when one is about to dive into an actual diagnostic or assessment of an ecosystem, where one needs to be quite clear about what is the phenomena, the real world phenomena that one is setting out to study. Um, so part of what we've realized is that um, there is a wide diversity of understandings of what a local innovation ecosystem really is referring to in practice. And that's reflected both in practice and also in the scholarly literature. Um, so for example, um, literature from the business and entrepreneurship fields and from the fields of innovation studies approach the concept in quite different ways. So given this kind of lack of starting consensus for our studies, both of our study teams realized that we needed to adopt a working definition and a working conceptual framework for our respective studies in order to guide us on the relevant dimensions of local innovation ecosystems and appropriate methods for doing so. So for that purpose, we chose to ground our studies in a conceptual framework um, that I've developed back in 2019, which is described in a publication available on the MIT DLAB website um, called Understanding Innovation Ecosystems, a Framework for Joint Analysis and Action. Um, and I think that, um, well, yes, thank you, Lizzie, for dropping that link to the publication in the chat. Um, this framework draws predominantly on existing literature in the field of innovation studies, focused on systems of innovation, or what are sometimes called IS, innovation systems, at the local and regional level, in terms of what scholars in that field see as the core attributes, structural features, and functional features of these ecosystems. It also draws on more foundational literature in the field of complex adaptive systems, such as the work of the pioneering systems researcher, Donella Meadows. Um, next slide, please. Um, and she identified that all systems, including complex adaptive systems, like biological and economic ecosystems, share the following attributes, um, which is what makes them a system rather than just a collection of random parts. So um, these systems have elements or components, which can be human and non-human elements, they have relationships or interconnections between those elements. And those elements and their relationships are organized around a core purpose or function that the system is set up to serve. So um, from there, we can, we can identify that an innovation system or an innovation ecosystem comprises the elements of consequence to innovation and the relationships amongst them at a very general level. So if we get more specific, um, next slide, please. Um, in this publication that I shared, we identified um, a working definition for our own work um, that sees local innovation ecosystems as place-based communities of interacting actors engaged in producing innovation and supporting processes of innovation. So that would be their purpose, along with the resources, infrastructure, and enabling environment, which allows them to create, adopt, and spread better ways of doing things. Um, and so given that that is a bit of a mouthful, um, next slide, please. Uh, we felt that it was helpful to kind of translate that into a visual framework that could provide a little bit more clarity on, on what we mean by each of those things. So in this framework at the center, we see the purpose, kind of what it is that these actors are, are trying to do through their interactions. Um, we see their interactions symbolized by this star that kind of interconnects them. And then we see actors um, identified both by actor type in the circle, um, the kind of pink circle. So businesses, networks, government, these are the, what you typically might think of as the triple helix or quadruple helix. 
a description of innovation ecosystem actors by the type of actor they are. But we also found that in the literature, it's very important to identify actors by the role that they're playing in the ecosystem, not just the type. So um, we have the roles in the white area with um, the icons. So roles like connect, um, roles like sharing knowledge, roles like providing funding, um, which actually can be done by different actor types. Um, next slide, please. At the bottom, we have um, a synthesis of what the literature identifies as being several of the very important resources that local innovation ecosystems need in order to function well. Not a comprehensive list, but it's ones where there's consensus that they're important. So resources like financial resources, infrastructure, human and social capital, and resources from the natural environment. Next slide. And then finally, at the top, we have key dimensions of the enabling environment, which I think one of our participants mentioned in the chat. Um, the, the, the rules of the game. So we have cultural and institutional context, which refers to those norms and regulatory frameworks. We have legal and regulatory and policy context, and also the market, market systems context, which provides kind of um, the overarching structure, um, the air that the ecosystem is breathing in order to function. Next slide. Um, and, and finally, kind of coming back to the, to the importance of purpose, um, what we know from the literature is that different ecosystems often share um, key actors and elements of relevance. So if you're looking at an entrepreneurial ecosystem and an innovation ecosystem, it, in a, especially in a single location, they might actually be sharing many of the same actors, um, sharing rules, sharing a regulatory framework, sharing resources. Um, what differentiates them and what allows one to study them in practice is that their purpose is different. So the purpose of an entrepreneurial ecosystem would be to facilitate startup activity. And I think someone mentioned that in the chat. Um, entrepreneurial activity of all types, whether it's traditional entrepreneurship or innovation-driven entrepreneurship. And the purpose of an innovation ecosystem is to stimulate and support processes of innovation, whether or not they're being carried out through enterprise. They might be carried out through policy, um, through existing systems like um, state health systems or state education systems. Um, and then of course there are ecosystems that are innovation-oriented entrepreneurship where those two concepts come together. Um, so that's one of the important pieces that we realized in our work is just the, you know, actors might be shared, but it's the purpose that helps us identify what type of ecosystem we're looking at. So while this framework um, serves as a clear starting point for both of our studies, it offers more of a high level kind of guiding post rather than a clear set of instructions for how to go about assessing these ecosystems in practice. What we found is that we needed to do additional conceptual and methodological work to operationalize this framework and be able to use it in a practical way to guide our respective studies. In particular, several aspects of the framework have required us to grapple with some practical questions that we did not initially have easy answers to, such as within a particular geographic area of interest, how does one go about identifying an innovation ecosystem to study? And know that it is in fact an ecosystem and not just a collection of actors and elements who are interested in interacting or becoming an ecosystem. Um, second, once one has identified an innovation ecosystem to study that is a functioning system, how does one practically go about identifying its purpose and core system functions? And then given that these systems are open systems with typically an unknown number of quant quantity of actors and elements, how does a study team construct their sample, so to say, in terms of knowing how many actors and elements it's sufficient to include in an ecosystem study for that to be robust? So in the remainder of our session today, um, in the format of a dialogue between our two teams, we'll be sharing with you what are some of the key implementation challenges that we've encountered, such as these, and how we've resolved them practically in our studies, um, leaving time at the end for all of you to engage with these questions as well. So to kick off this dialogue, um, I'll pass the, the digital microphone over to my colleague, Elias. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So let's start with the definition. What have been some of the challenges for the HATES team in using the term innovation ecosystem as the central focus of your study? Hi, Elias, thanks for this question. Um, and very happy to be here with everyone today. So I think going back to what Elizabeth stated around the lack of consensus with regards to the definition of an innovation ecosystem, our team has certainly struggled with understanding some of the differences between you know, innovation activities, economic activities, entrepreneurship activities, and the mixture of activities that span the categories. And since our study is focused on strengthening the role that higher education institutions can play in generating output, it was really important that we had a common working understanding of what counted as innovation, because we were about to sit out and measure it. And not only were we about to sit out and measure it, but we were about to do it in three different contexts, uh, Kenya, the Philippines, and Indonesia. So we needed to make sure that we could communicate the definition of innovation to the people that we were working with um, in studying these systems, but also to the people that we were interviewing so that as they were responding, they could be answering our questions properly. 
Now, our study is still in the beginning stages of um, unfolding. And so we're in the process of holding those interviews and we'll have more learnings on how our stakeholders viewed the concept of innovation differently. But I can at least speak to how our country teams viewed the definition. And towards the beginning, we got a little bit tripped up in moving beyond some of the common measurements of innovation, like patents, towards a more holistic understanding of innovation as creative ways of doing things, not just new products. And I think one thing that helped center our teams was um, using the definition provided by someone named Innovatsvia um, from their 2019 publication, who stated that innovation could be considered three things. So the first is the introduction, development, and operation of new value-added products. And I think from this definition, I would emphasize new and value-added in operation as some key terms there. And then also the update and expansion of social services and markets for services. And finally, the development of new social technologies. And I think that's probably the aspect of the definition that we are most familiar with. And so we use this definition to center our three teams across these three contexts to make sure that we're approaching measuring innovation with kind of a baseline common agreement of what counts as innovation. But I'm gonna put that aside because I actually think with regards to the definitional concept of innovation ecosystem, the more important challenge for our team and for our context actually has been not with the term innovation, I think once we agreed on a definition, that problem was um, shelved, but actually more with the, what counted as ecosystems. And there's a lot of people out there that look at the word ecosystem and think of it as some sort of metaphor for behavior. But within our study and I, within Elizabeth and Elias's studies, you know, we have emphasized that an ecosystem is actually a very specific observable phenomena of collaboration that begins to arise as innova innovation activity matures in a given location. And so an innovation ecosystem involves, and this is important, ongoing collaborations between actors pursuing innovative activities. And so because of this, not all innovative activities count as being part of an innovation ecosystem. And this is something that we've had to learn and had to make sure that we were not studying per se. So, you know, sometimes innovation might happen in silo groups. Sometimes there might be collaboration on a particular innovation product. And then once that product is in the market, the innovation collaboration results, these sorts of things. But our project is, is interested in understanding how higher education systems can be interacted, can interact and be involved in ongoing innovation ecosystems. So therefore our partners needed to make sure that what we were studying was actually an ecosystem. And this is important, not just from an academic perspective of wanting to maintain consistency conceptually with um, the literature, but from an actual policy perspective, because governments are orienting their innovation strategy towards incentivizing innovation ecosystems. So, it need, so on our side, we wanted to prioritize that we're actually studying these systems in order to be able to present accurate policy recommendations to our participating governments um, who wanted to know how to strengthen this very specific type of approach to innovation output. So again, you know, even though there's disagreement around the term innovation ecosystem um, in the literature and in practice, the phenomena is really important to study because it's being prioritized in national innovation strategies. You know, at the top of my head, the 2018 Philippine Inclusive Philippine Innovation Entrepreneurship Roadmap is a great example. And, you know, there's actually currently ongoing pro um, projects at USAID and other places, such as the Stride Project in the Philippines, that are actively trying to support the development of these ecosystems. So it was really important for our team to make sure that we were centered on the definition. And now I'm going to pass off to my colleague, Dr. Mutama, who can provide a little bit more specificity when it came to the Kenyan context. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Lizzie. Um, one way we resolved the uncertainty over the term innovation ecosystem, even though it, is, it might look different in any given context, was to focus on the implicit assumption of sustainability within the term. And in the Kenyan context, uh, several innovations involve natural resources. And in this case, we, uh, we looked at sustainability in the context of um, the economic benefit, the environmental benefit, and the social benefits that uh, um, uh, not only short term, medium term, but um, uh, uh, in terms of the long term sustainability. Um, what we mean by this is that um, uh, having uh, several uh, factors that determine uh, what would happen within, uh, say, a given year, especially when we are talking of natural resources, um, and medium term, uh, partly connected to um, systems that drive governments, um, could be an, an electoral cycle, and of course now the long-term sustainability. Uh, thank you, and over to you, Lizzie. Yeah, you know, I think that's one thing that was very interesting, Dr. Muthama, that, that we've talked about, um, is that our team in Indonesia 
arrived at almost the same assumption independently of your team of this concept of sustainability as an implicit um, component of an innovation ecosystem. And they stressed, you know, as they were looking at different innovation outputs around their country and trying to select one to prioritize, that they really needed some proof of sustainability, that the system had lasted over time. It was not just some sort of one-off success. And you know, one of the challenges I think in studying innovation ecosystems in general, and especially in low and middle income countries, is that where innovation is still nascent, it can be challenging to find these ecosystems because actors have yet to build the trust and connections that they need to continue to organically create these ongoing collaborations. And so I think a good example in the Indonesian context is, you know, um, from a national government policy perspective, they're really interested in developing these science techno parks as locations where innovation activities and collaborations can happen. They call them KSTs. They've also been known as SCPs in other parts of the literature. However, you know, the number of KSTs originally were slated to be around 100, and, and this has moved down to 22, given the lack of coordination, infrastructure, and budget. And this is very understandable. Um, setting up innovation ecosystems can be difficult and costly, um, and, you know, in some degree requires organic trust and collaboration on the part of the actors. But I think for our Indonesian team, the question really remained whether we could call these nascent systems ecosystems, especially if this core concept that we've arrived upon of sustainability was in doubt. That's that's a great um, question and, and puzzlement, Lizzie, um, since all too often we do see national and local policymakers assume that simply by co-locating certain types of businesses together, say in science parks um, or so-called so innovation districts, um, that a system of innovation, a local ecosystem will necessarily emerge almost by default, right? But as you and Dr. Mathama note, um, and as we've been discussing, an ecosystem implies really a co-evolving pattern of relationships and interactions between actors, and also between actors and other elements like local resources and intangible elements like cultural norms that persist over time and that are meaningfully embedded in their surrounding social and environmental context as all biological ecosystems are. Um, so co-location of elements in a system is helpful, but it's certainly not enough to turn those elements into a working ecosystem. And just because we might find actors co-located in a science park or industrial zone or innovation district, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll find a functioning innovation ecosystem there. So that implies that we need to look beyond mere co-location of actors as a criteria for determining if there is in fact an innovation ecosystem in a particular geographic area. So with that in mind, I'm really interested to see or hear how your teams built on your insights regarding the importance of sustainability and sustainable interactions um, to identify and select innovation ecosystems to focus on for the height study. And maybe I'll turn that over to Dr. Muthama to address. Yeah, um, thank you. Now, originally, um, we were going to use the Notre Dame team's guidance for the purpose. Uh, basically looking at uh, up and coming versus strong ecosystems. And uh, what we did, we started with the, um, the Kenya innovation ecosystem um, to, to identify uh, which uh, particular interesting areas would be of uh, interest to us. We went back uh, to the concept of uh, an ecosystem. And in order for a system to be a system, uh, you should look for the following components, actors, resources, and relationships. In the ideal world, uh, we wanted to start with the locating different shared goals or purposes of innovation, but lacking uh, data, basically, or evidence that documents purpose of innovation ecosystem, we needed to start with actors and back ourselves into the purpose. Now, um, in this case now, for Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan process, we looked at uh, the Kenya innovation um, ecosystem and we, 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 we recognize there are about 10 broad uh, themes um, that are already established. So we identified um, particularly, we, we narrowed down to the agri-tech um, since Kenya's economy um, is largely agriculture driven. And now within the agri-tech um, uh, uh, portion, we, we picked bee farming innovation ecosystem on the basis of the transformational potential um, uh, that it has. Um, and this uh, uh, is, is the process that we are looking at. Now, in terms of the, um, uh, the concepts um, uh, of purpose, um, in our study, we feel that we have a very clearly defined purpose based on what I have just presented. However, in your study, are you seeing in the ecosystems that you are looking at uh, that there is um, 
uh, innovation, uh, I mean, uh, there's, there's a single um, clearly stated purpose? That's a great question. Um, and, and the short answer, the short answer is no. Um, but you, you know, you're right that frequently the purpose of a system, particularly a complex adaptive system, um, like an innovation ecosystem, it's not necessarily explicitly agreed on by the actors or codified in a single identifiable source or stated as kind of a single statement um, that one can identify through a literature search. More often it's implicit and it has to be identified inductively by looking at how the system is functioning and also what the system is producing in terms of concrete results over time. So, you know, an example from, from agriculture is that if one were to go to a farm and observe a composting system in the form of piles of organic debris and manure over here, and maybe some composting bins over there, perhaps a scrap sorting system in the other corner, corner of the yard and other elements, the purpose of that system might not be written down anywhere. But through observing how the system works over time, maybe over the course of a week, um, and how people and other elements move through that system, one could start to deduce that the system has a purpose and that the purpose is to reduce the amount of waste that leaves the farm or to return nutrients back to the farm or something along those lines. And that might be said differently by different people observing the system, um, but essentially getting at the same, the same function and purpose. So, in that example, we see something important about identifying a system's purpose, which is that different people might talk about it in slightly different ways. Um, but if it is a functioning system, then those various statements of the purpose will be basically getting at the same ideas. And then the, a research team can paraphrase that into a description of the system's purpose, even if it hasn't been explicitly written as such in any particular source. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at in our ecosystem diagnostic when we look at the system's purpose. To what extent is there a convergence or a general conceptual similarity in how actors in the innovation ecosystem are talking about the system's purpose? Are they using different phrases to talk about the same basic thing? Or are they actually pointing to very different purposes, which might indicate that they're either actually referring to different systems that perhaps share some important key actors and elements, or that the system is so nascent that a clear purpose hasn't really coalesced yet. So perhaps it's actors with a desire for an innovation ecosystem, but not an ecosystem yet. Um, and on that last point, we're starting to see that the extent to which an innovation ecosystem's purpose has been clearly articulated by actors within the system can be indicative of the strength um, and to some extent the maturity of that system. So to give an example, MIT is well known as having a mature innovation ecosystem, and we can see priority setting with regard to the goals of this ecosystem taking place at the campus wide level in the form of coordinating cross campus initiatives like the MIT Innovation Initiative. Um, which more recently has become a kind of campus-wide, they call it innovation headquarters, um, with a website and other forms of documentation that point us towards statements of the ecosystem's purpose. But at UVG, which has a much more nascent ecosystem, where really um, the innovation ecosystem has only been a focus of the administration of the university for the past five years, we don't yet see a coordinating body within the university whose mandate includes defining the purpose, establishing the desired results, or setting the agenda of the system. Um, and in the nearly 30 key informant interviews that we've conducted to date with actors within that university's innovation ecosystem, we, we see that reflected in the, in the results. So we've heard that many respondents think that the university does not yet have a clear purpose for its innovation ecosystem, and they aren't aware of who, who would be responsible for establishing that purpose, um, as doing so doesn't really clearly fall within the mandate of any existing entity on campus. Um, other respondents have offered a variety of potential current purposes, and those answers are so far quite divergent pointing in several fundamentally different directions, which helps us conclude that the ecosystem is still in a really formative stage. Many of the important elements required for the ecosystem are present, but they do not yet appear to be coordinating smoothly together around a clear set of functions and purpose to produce a coherent and predictable set of results over time, which is really the attribute of a mature system. So in sum, back to your question, in our diagnostic study, we're not looking to find a single statement of the ecosystem's purpose, but we're rather looking at how different actors articulate the purpose. And then we're assessing the extent to which um, those articulations converge or diverge conceptually. Um, and that's a process that Elias will, will describe in a little bit more detail from the technical side. So over to you, Elias. Uh, thank you, Elsa Patekia. So when it comes to the assessment, we're, we're going for two approaches here. Uh, slide 11, okay, thank you. So the one that we are implementing in the diagnostic study is like an open-ended questions in key informant interviews. So here we let ecosystem actors define what they think is the system purpose and assess the degree of convergence and divergence by looking at the variability of responses from actors through frequency distribution and other qualitative quantitative means over time. So we see the dynamics, how it 
converges and diverges over time. A very different assessment approach that we are planning is, is also again a closed ended option to select from surveys, which builds on the answers we got from the uh, key informant interviews. This could also help us deal with the challenge that Elizabeth mentioned that actors sometimes find it a bit difficult to clearly articulate the system's purpose, especially in individualized interview settings. The idea is we ourselves identify like a list of purposes as exhaustive as possible through the document reviews, KIIs and diagnostic interviews. And then we let actors choose or rank what they think is or are the main purpose of the ecosystem. So we're, we're mainly going for these two approaches. Thank you for this, Elias. Um, this is good insight for our team because you know we're about to begin these series of workshops with our key stakeholders in each of our countries. And we're gonna be having them discuss challenges related to the innovation ecosystems under study. And then we're gonna be using those inputs to better tailor our study to each of the country's priorities and needs. And you know, part of this workshop is gonna require us beginning with some sort of common understanding of the boundaries of the innovation ecosystem. So hearing from you guys about um, expected divergences in opinion, um, but the fact that often there's overlapping um, conceptions is gonna be helpful for us as we anticipate what that conversation will look like. But I think I might set that aside because I, I actually wanna ask you guys about a different question that our team has been having um, that since your study is a little bit further along than our study is, um, I would love to know um, how you guys have approached this challenge. So one of the things that's happening is that because we're doing these workshops, we're in the process of selecting who should be coming to these system thinking um, activities, as well as how many people we need to be uh, contacting for both prior to the workshops and then after, after the workshops. Um, when we're conducting the actual research in our studies. And one of our questions has been, you know, how deep do we go um, with different actors in the system? So, you know, an innovation system has, in some ways, many layers. So at the core layer, you know, there are these key actors, people producing the innovations, people funding the innovations, people designing the policies, and so on. But, you know, we've had conversations in our team about the importance of potentially taking a step back and thinking about some of those second order individuals, you know, who might be producing the natural resources, might be contributing to the human capital, these sorts of things. And there could be in some ways, you know, an infinite amount of people we could study. And so I guess from, you know, from a methodological perspective, my question for you guys is, as you're learning more about the, your university-based innovation ecosystem, how did you identify the relevant actors? And beyond that, how did you know when you've identified enough of them to reach saturation to understand the system? Another great question, Lizzie, um, because as we discussed previously, innovation ecosystems are typically open systems, meaning that we don't have a way of knowing a priori the total set of relevant system actors and elements. So we have to discover these through the research process. Um, so in the context of the UVG ecosystem diagnostic and previous diagnostic work, um, which you can actually see on the slide here that we'll speak to shortly, um, we've been experimenting with two different and complementary approaches to doing this. Um, so the first approach is through traditional snowball referral techniques, in which we started by identifying actors that we knew based on the existing literature and the mandate of their work to be relevant players in UVG's innovation ecosystem. These, this initial small group of actors, it was about five or six, helped us develop an initial list of 30 um, interviewees for key informant interviews. And then we used these interviews to generate a much more extensive list of actors by asking interviewees to name their collaborators on work related to innovation, entrepreneurship, and research for development, as well as to list out any other key actors or elements of the university-based ecosystem that they felt should be included in the diagnostic study. So this process has so far generated a list of over 140 actors, which is a really good starting point within the context of this university. The second approach, which we're currently in the middle of, involves administering a social network survey to all 140 actors identified in the key informant phase, in which we'll be asking them to identify up to 30 contacts with whom they engage in innovation related activity, including the exchange of information, knowledge, resources, and support. So we'll then be comparing the actor list generated by the key informant interviews alone with the actor list generated through the survey, which we anticipate will be a more extensive list, but might also include some actors who are more tangentially involved in the ecosystem than those mentioned by key informants. 
Finally, a third approach, which we're planning to use in a different innovation ecosystem study, but have not yet incorporated into the UVG diagnostic, is to convene a participatory workshop with the actors who end up being centrally positioned on the social network maps that result from the surveys. So in, in, in these maps, if we were looking at the maps that are on the screen right now from Montevideo and Bogota, which is actually from a previous study, you'll see that there are some nodes that are larger and more centrally located in the system. Um, we would be essentially analyzing those more centrally um, positioned nodes in the network and then convening those actors um, to come to a participatory workshop where they will help us sort the full actor list generated by the surveys into three broad buckets. Those who are definitely members of the ecosystem, those who are definitely not members of the ecosystem, and those actors where it's not clear the extent to which they may or may not be part of the system. So like our approach to identifying a purpose, this is a kind of shades of gray approach that aims to create buckets of actors and that focuses mostly on identifying those actors that are clearly and unambiguously part of the system, rather than getting really um, kind of tied up and worried about exactly where the cutoff line is in the case of actors where it might not be so clear, as that is really quite difficult to do in these types of open systems. Thank you, Elizabeth. Actor networks, uh, which nectar, I mean, net network metrics are most important to study from the perspective of innovation? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mudama. I'll, I'll response to this. So, uh, you know, the notion that networks are central to innovation is, is well established, but uh, there are different views as to how networks, like our collaborative structures, influence innovation. We are following two major analytical approaches relevant to our work. Uh, one is relational-based and then structural-based network analysis. The relational aspect includes network as attributes like the numbers, intensity, and quality of interaction. And we ask how does the quality and quantity of individual networks influence innovation? And this has been a prominent approach innovation in development domain, but seems to only tell part of the story because complex adaptive systems are best analyzed as a whole system, which is about a broader network structure aspects that includes like uh, to what extent the network is open, the density of the network, actors network position. We ask here what type of network configuration is good for innovation. Our diagnostic study approached so from these two perspectives of relational and structural embeddedness. So generally, if you look at the slides, generally strong quality interaction among diverse actors contributes positively to innovation outcomes. If you look, for instance, the network configuration from Montevideo, we see that diverse actors represented by different colors are interacting in a dense network. And this could provide the opportunity for better collaborative action in terms of pulling relevant resources to, you know, to put new ideas or ways of doing things into practice, which we call innovation. Uh, on the contrary, more open networks like the one you see in the Bogota case have relatively limited capacity in that regard. Oh, if you look on the Sao Paulo network on the next slide, please. you would further see that there are more nodes, actors in the network bridging different clusters of networks. So as much as these actors connecting such structural holes play a key role in the flow of critical resources, like information, knowledge, skills, and finances that are key to innovation in a broader network of actors, you know, changes or breakups in those networks will have a significant impact on the capacity of the ecosystem to innovate. So to sum up, you know, characterizing the different actor networks at the ecosystem level and the quality and quantity of individual actor interacting plays an important role in the determining where to usefully alter or reconfigure relationship to advance innovation entrepreneurial activity. And in terms of the network metrics, we are focusing both on the relational metrics, like I said, that pertain to specific actors in the innovation ecosystem such as the intensity and usefulness of their innovation related collaborations, the diversity of actors with whom they are collaborating, while also looking at the overall network attributes of the system, such as its density uh, or openness, the diversity of different actor types playing different system roles, and the extent to which this subclustering, like we see in the Sao Paulo case. 
Thank you. Thank you, Elias, for that. And thanks so much, Elizabeth um, and Elias, for your presentation. You know, as you guys are one step ahead of the Heights team, um, your findings on purpose, divergence, actor selection, and the impact of networks configuration is certainly going to guide our team as we begin to analyze the role that higher education institutions are playing in these innovation ecosystems. And, you know, this fireside chat um, is a very unique format, and it might be helpful for our audience before we do q and A's just to quickly kind of summarize um, what we've found based on discussing um, our different project challenges. And I think we can break them into three different areas um, uh, or themes, I guess, of findings based on um, oper operationalizing this 2019 ecosystem framework. So I think first, in summary, um, you know, we need to ensure that all members of the team, including our local partners and even key informants for the research, have some sort of shared understanding of how that particular study is conceptualizing an innovation ecosystem. You know, everyone needs to be on the same page about what this concept is referring to, both in general terms of a shared definition, but also in very specific terms, such as, you know, the extent to which geography and co-location matters within a given system. Um, and so, you know, as you're studying, like you have to be asking, are you looking at a hyper-local system, an urban system, a regional system? These will all impact our understandings. Um, and we also need to be able to decide for ourselves the extent to which um, being able to identify a well-defined or coherent purpose for the system is actually important because there may be times in which um, different actors share different perspectives on what the innovation ecosystem is actually doing. And, you know, are we looking for a system that is a clear defined purpose? Um, and is that, can we consider that a very well mature um, and well established ecosystem? Or is our team interested in setting an ecosystem where the purpose might not be yet articulated, but rather might be stated in different ways by different groups with a greater or lesser degree of convergence? And, you know, as you guys have described, this can be actually be deduced through, uh, through preliminary key informant interviews and surveys and doing some analysis work as Elliot's previously described. And then, you know, second, once an innovation ecosystem has been identified, there's a practical need to be able to, to define its boundaries, at least to the extent to be able to determine which actors and elements definitely should be included in the system um, and which should be excluded in this case. Over to you, Elizabeth. It looks like Elizabeth might have dropped off. Elias, do you want to take um, the final point for your team? You're on mute. You're on mute, Elias. Thank you. I, I, I just unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, you know, we've learned from both our experiences that uh, this is easier said than done in practice and requires some clarity regarding what the key functions of a particular innovation systems of interest are, which in turn brings us, you know, back to the importance of some degree of identifiability, identifiable purpose for the system because it's that purpose which enables us to identify which are the relevant sets of system functions that are needed. And with regard to knowing how many actors and elements to include in the ecosystem assessment, you know, both our teams have been operating under the assumption that the system uh, the system that we're studying are open system and uh, and have therefore been working to identify actors at the center of the system. You know, the most relevant actors who others can agree are key players in the system as a first step. We have then been using snowball referral techniques in our uh, key informant interviews and name generators in social network surveys to generate a large and comprehensive list as we can, focusing less on the analysis of determining the outer system boundaries and more on identifying the total set of actors that multiple other actors agree are definitely playing in the system. 
So having said this, and now let's let's turn to the audience. Uh, if if there is uh, nothing that you would say from your side, uh, Lizzie. Yes, thank you, thank you, Elias. Um, and we can pull down the the slideshow at this point. Thanks, thanks, Adam. Um, and well, I know we already have a couple questions in the chat, and these are great great questions to start with. So um, I'll read them out loud, and then. Um, we can just jump in and answer from our different perspectives of our study. So the first one is from Uzma Anzar, who asks, what are some challenges of local funding availability for starting and sustaining innovation ecosystems? Can they germinate without international funding and for how long can they survive? So I don't know if perhaps Elias, you wanna take from your perspective or Dr. Muthama, if you wanna talk about the Kenyan context, that could be a good place to start. Yeah, thank, thank you, Lizzie. I, I could um, start us off. Um, I, I think there is a place for, um, for growth, uh, especially where we have the actors, uh, particularly those um, that are, um, are interested in um, uh, ent entrepreneurial work, uh, because that would generate some form of uh, sustainability um, in the sense that um, uh, there will be uh, growth in terms of uh, uh, demand and supply for some of the services or products. Uh, so there is a place for, for it. How uh, big it can be is a different question, but it is something that in my view uh, from a Kenyan context uh, would actually grow. Um, thank you and over to you. Please. Yeah, if I could ask a follow-up question to that, Dr. Muthama. So, you know, in the Kenyan context, you guys are going to be studying the honey supply chain. Um, and as you have begun to, you know, have these key informant interviews um, and to uh, look through the literature on um, what the honey supply chain looks like in the Kenyan context, have you seen that it has been, um, that it has required reliance on international funding? Or have you seen more of an organic um generation of collaboration that came from other funding sources, maybe at the national level, regional level, or, or local level? Yes, I would um, I, I would say that um, the, the organic growth would probably be the, 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 main, the, the main player. Certainly, of course, international funding can be catalytic, but organic growth in the sense that um, when there is interest and uh, there are different players in, in terms of the actors, uh, the number of actors growing in number um, that would uh, generate uh, that kind of growth certainly of course we appreciate the fact that uh, uh, ex external um, um, input would probably take it to a new higher level uh, but without it doesn't mean that it will not um, it will not grow thank you and over to you lizzie thank you dr mithama elias anything to add from your side before we move on to the next question no okay that sounds good. So the next question came from Rebecca, um, who asked, to what extent are you finding that the innovation ecosystems have grown organically versus being proactively established by top, a top-down way, either by the university or more broadly by government policy drivers? And she's curious to know if this has had any impact on efficacy. So I might start by taking this question, and I think Dr. Muthama from the Kenyan context, if you wanna ever jump in and add anything from your insight. Um, that would be great. I think this is a fantastic question because I think this is something that policymakers are actually grappling with at the moment is, you know, this conundrum of wanting to create supportive policy measures in, in um, encouraging collaboration. But the fact that innovation collaboration to some degree is also an in, in organic um, manifestation um, of relationships. And so I think to be honest, what we have seen so far in the literature, now granted, so for our study, we are only just now beginning the process of conducting key informant interviews, and these are just preliminary interviews. So our study is still at a pretty nascent stage. So what I'm saying is just based on what we've been reading in the literature, is that to some degree, the most successful models have involved supportive policy measures and agenda setting. So having national governments that are like the, like the Philippines government that has that national roadmap or like the Indonesian context where you know, they're, they're focused on generating these SCPs. So having that supportive policy environment is crucial to be able to have these um, innovation ecosystems. But I think one of the key challenges that gets lost in always trying to use a top-down measure is the fact that innovation ecosystems are largely successful when there's trust. And when there's policy measures that are focused on um, encouraging that trust and enhancing it. So I think a great example is, you know, 
uh, we've done a lot of work in learning from our stride partners who, who are trying to build these innovation ecosystems in the Philippines and work with the government on doing so. And one thing that they've really noted is that what's really important is not just having in innovation policies that focus on you know, providing funding, um, laying out some of those purposes that we talked about the innovation ecosystems, but also policies that remove barriers to collaboration and that in some ways in removing policies that um, that might generate mistrust between actors. So I'm thinking very specifically on having, you know, a high barrier to entry with being able to get patents. Um, I'm thinking of like intellectual property rights and really allowing, especially for university settings, really allowing those researchers to be able to confidently engage with industry actors while being able to maintain some ownership over their ideas. So oftentimes what really makes universities reticent to be able to be engaged in these system comes down to some of those more bureaucratic processes and a lack of trust between actors. And you know, in the Indonesian context, I'd mentioned that, you know, we've we've decreased the number of innovation ecosystems, I'm sorry, of SDPs from, from 100 to 22. And they're really focused on trying to, to foster these 22 SDPs, um, but that's challenging. And we're actually, our team in Indonesia actually belongs to one of those SDPs and has spoken quite candidly about the fact that just because the government has created these supportive policies for bringing actors together, that's not necessarily enough and actually to generate ongoing collaboration. So there is some need for both encouraging trust and also letting kind of this organic bottom up vision of collaboration um, arise. So I don't know, Elias or Dr. Muthama, if you have anything else to add to that. I think I would I would I would probably add a more general, you know, perspective on this one, where many of the practical challenges in terms of bottom up, uh, you know, bottom up or top down approach are concerned are, are more or less similar. Many of the uh, developmental challenges that we're we're dealing with, particularly in the global south, but uh, you know, in the with the in a, the you know the role of the broader system where powerful actors are existing is in enabling the surrounding environment where you know this ecosystem uh, small ecosystems can nurture themselves with a protected space where you know a group of actors like the universities and the industries can come up together and create that learning protective state in the form of a strategic niche management where in time when they mature they have, you know, a very positive interaction and mutual shaping with the broader enabling environment. So I think in the core of all this transition process of creating a very viable uh, uh, innovation ecosystem is, you know, tipping this balance between developing the trust between, you know, horizontal actors to, to, to develop you know, this niche of uh, innovation ecosystem and interacting with the broader environment where they create the network where these powerful actors play more of a supportive backup and, uh, you know, creating a more conducive environment for the innovation uh, ecosystem to, to mature over time. Great, thanks Elias for that. Um, just looking at time, we only have about two minutes left. So we are gonna just pick one more question and apologies that we aren't able to get to all the questions. Um, and this one comes from Rob Segan, who is wondering if there are ways in which we think differently between ecosystem and you know other concepts of community or culture, or if you see these um, as complementary. So I'll put that question out there. I don't know Dr. Muthama or Elias if you'd like to answer. Um, if not, I can take it. Yeah, please. Dr. Muthama. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, I think this is an interesting question about this idea between community um, and culture. I think first, um, what I'll say is that for innovation ecosystems, um, to some degree, you're bringing together uh, actors that could have acted in isolation. So I, I, I think that's the difference between thinking of it as already a naturally occurring community versus um, an actual ecosystem. So a great example is, you know, the level, the degree to which there's separation between some of your policymakers and, you know, a university researcher who wants to come in and actually work on, on one of the policy agenda items that um, the government the agenda has. That, um, the government. I think there's um, a similar, uh, you can also make a similar comparison between some of these funders that might be coming in to support innovative activities. Now, I think this question of culture is really important. And I think, you know, I, I will say, I think all of these are very complementary to each other. Um, 
and community can definitely help with trust building, but culture is also important. So I think culture gets at the question of risk taking and the the um, the comfort, you know, in in general terms of um, a certain given set of actors to actually be able to take that risk and make that investment. Um, in the innovation because a lot of them are going to fail. Um, and so having an ongoing collaborative uh, spirit within these ecosystems does require a culture that that fosters um, that risk-taking ability. And that's actually one of the things we're gonna be specifically studying within um, our study is looking at some of these norms, perceptions, and values um, of the context uh, that we're focused on to see if culture and to see if just in general terms, whether or not some of the normal ways of doing things impacts whether or not actors are wanting to collaborate on innovation. And I think this gets at a little bit more of that social role of innovation, not just some of the more uh, technical questions of patents or um, you know funding, and, and uh, gets, I think, at the heart of, of what it takes to be collaborative. So I think with that, um, we're going to need to transition to let the next um, presentation uh, use this space. But I just want to thank everyone um, for joining us today and to listening to our presentation. And please, if uh, there are continued questions that you have for our teams as we begin to launch these studies, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. So thank you all so much. All right, bye.